Hello and welcome to this webinar presented by the Peter Jones Foundation with Josh Turner from Stanford Socks. Say hello in the chat box, type where you're watching from, we'd love to hear from you. You can use the chat box to ask questions throughout and the questions tab. We've uploaded two polls, so have a look at those, submit your answers and we'll come back to them um, during the presentation. So a bit about the Peter Jones Foundation before we start. Igniting Enterprise is a webinar brought to you by the Peter Jones Foundation. We were set up in 2005 by Star of Dragon's Den and businessman Peter Jones, and our aim is to champion business, enterprise, and entrepreneurship. We believe that with the right mix of opportunity and support, every young person has potential to achieve great things and the right to a brighter future. We run courses, qualifications, competitions for young people, and have a really vibrant alumni network of ambitious young entrepreneurs who are doing great things in business. Josh, uh, Turner, who's joining us today, spoke at Entfest 2019 and is due to speak at Entfest, our Festival of Enterprise and Entrepreneurship, again this year, but we're bringing that content online. So who is Josh? Josh is the founder of Stanford Socks and believes that business can be the greatest force for good. Um, Stanford Socks is committed to creating a business that supports good causes through every purchase. And Josh himself is a serial entrepreneur who was buying and selling off eBay, um, in his early teens, went on to run club nights with students, completed an entrepreneur accelerator scheme, built a tech startup, and met the Dragons on Dragon's Den in 2019. We're really pleased to have him. He's got like a really inspiring um, entrepreneurial journey, starting young and sort of building his career as he came along. So we're going to hear about Stan for Socks, we're going to hear about um, Josh's journey, and we're going to hear a bit more about social enterprise, what it means and why it's important. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Josh now, but keep the questions coming throughout and um, enjoy. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Um, and great to be here. Um, I always find these webinar things odd because I can't see the audience, but uh, yeah, write any um, sort of questions in the comments as we go along, but I think we'll do a longer sort of Q&A at the end. Um, so let's go. So my slides, one second. Yep. So this is me. Um, I've grown up uh, quite a little bit more since since this picture was taken, uh, but kind of always been an entrepreneur from a young age. Um, starting, uh, basically, I'm dyslexic, so I kind of struggled with traditional school. Um, went to a school very much where if you weren't going to become kind of a lawyer or a banker or a doctor, uh, there wasn't much support for kind of the creative kind of industries or sign a business. Um, so kind of struggled with school, but you know, enjoyed it, but not uh, academically. Um, but kind of always kind of aspire to kind of make money more than I could from sort of a Saturday job. So I was sort of always starting up little side projects, rounding up items around the house to sell back to the family. Uh, Mum shut me down when I started expanding into jewellery. Um, but, you know, was kind of doing more than kind of that Saturday day job, you know, buying and selling from eBay, um, sourcing, uh, doing club nights um, and all sorts. Um, this is a picture of kind of one of our uh, club nights. This is when I was 17. Um, I kind of realized there was a gap in the market for um, basically being when you're under 18, you're kind of too, when you're sorry, 16, 17, you're kind of too cool to go to an under 18 disco. Uh, I call it a disco to make it sound less cool, but kind of, yeah, you're not interested in going to that anymore. Uh, but there's only so many times on the school holidays you can go to the cinema bowling with your mates. Um, so it can cause a lot of antisocial behaviour with people trying to get fake IDs and go to club nights and bars um, or drinking in the streets. So we organised some club nights where we could have um, a range of venues to have 16 to 21 year olds in the same venue with separate rooms and wristbands. Um, and we leveraged social media because obviously being in that age group we understood how to market something rather than doing flyers like uh, all the other you know old school old school nightclubs were doing we could use influencers uh, in the sense of popular kids in different schools against each other to pre-sell tickets um this is kind of the picture that we always say sums up our first night that we launched um we pre-sold uh, we kept basically 700 tickets back for the door um and we sold like 2000 before and basically the police uh, on a Tuesday night in Ipswich uh, were not expecting the scenes when I think they estimated there were 3,000 kids uh, turned up for these 700 tickets on the door. Um, police riot vans out, it was absolute chaos um, in the sense that it was just too popular. Um, the club couldn't handle it, um, the police nearly shut us down, but we, we just about kept the night going. Um, we shut down McDonald's um, because there's too many young people in the town centre. 
Um, but kind of a wild sort of success from a marketing and idea point of view, uh, just probably some lessons learned from logistics and other things. Um, and then kind of going on through school, um, basically I nearly got expelled multiple times for starting businesses. Um, not that I was disguised up businesses, I did verge on the line of probably what was legal. Um, I wasn't selling anything too illegal, but you know, a little bit of fake IDs or some counterfeit items from China um, and kind of kind of pushing the limits of every time I saw a problem, being able to kind of overcome it, but not probably always doing that in the right way. Uh, and I remember my headmaster sitting me down and this picture kind of sums it up um, probably on the third or fourth time now. Still hadn't expelled me, but it's given me kind of very stern words about ships in the olden times, firing a warning shot across the path of other ships to get them to change course. Um, he was sort of saying, you know, this entrepreneurship and these kind of creativity you have is great, but let's make sure it's, you know, on the right course and let's, let's not go a certain way. Uh, I left school, uh, voted the most likely to end up a millionaire or in prison. Uh, neither's happened yet, so that's good. Um, but kind of very much that kind of character growing up, um, obviously very different to what I do now. Um, I did go on to university. I studied at Birmingham, um, where I did business management. I, um, believe it or not, I mean, you can't really see, see the size of me here, but I played American football. Um, and that's kind of one of the main things I enjoyed at uni. Um, kind of, we had this head coach called uh, Wayne Hill, who's the Great Britain head coach, who always taught us mentality of do things better than they've ever been done before. Um, so, you know, whether that's in personal life, friendship, business, everything, and it's kind of one of the mentalities I've kind of kept in what I do today, um, kind of looking at things and doing it better than it's already being done. Um, whether that's completely new innovation or just things that, you know, around already, um, obviously like socks. Um, but very much at university, I was kind of you know, studying a business degree, was kind of taught that there's kind of two rule books. You kind of either go on and start a business or you start a charity. There's no kind of middle ground. You know, you kind of either go start something and make hopefully loads of money and be good for yourself or you go become a nice person and do good. And you kind of can't cross, cross the two here, um, which obviously we know is not true. Um, so graduating, leaving university with a degree in business, I uh, very much, I didn't literally Google being an entrepreneur, but obviously I'd always been an entrepreneur, that's always what I wanted to do. Um, and this is now the first point in my life when there wasn't that next step, you know, everything else had kind of been roughly planned out, even though I stumbled along it as such. Um, so kind of literally was like being an entrepreneur. Um, I joined this program called the New Entrepreneurs Foundation uh, in London. Um, it's kind of an entrepreneur accelerator, but for entrepreneurs rather than um, for business ideas. Um, so it's really good, kind of put me into a cohort of 30 other young, like-minded people who also want to start business. And kind of for the first time in my life, I was actually encouraged to be an entrepreneur rather than discouraged to be one, um, surrounded by you know, like-minded people. I went on to, uh, I just started working with Virgin actually at this point, um, three days a week and then work as a kind of entrepreneur in residence and then doing uh, this entrepreneur accelerator two days a week. Um, the idea that I was kind of launching at the time was a Tinder for corporate expenses. Um, most random idea at the time. It was basically seeing in a big corporate like Virgin, the expenses policies and the technology that they were using was very old and clunky. Uh, and I could kind of see Tinder and all these apps that were coming out and how they made things so slick and easy. And being a naive kind of entrepreneur, I kind of thought, well, how can we not adapt this technology that's all slick and amazing with this old clunky systems? Um, I really didn't care much about uh, corporate finance and uh, accounting, but I kind of saw it as a billion dollar idea as such and kind of pursued that. Um, however, uh, about six months later, fed up with that kind of idea, realized to get off the ground, I really needed, uh, you know, to get like MasterCard, Visa, all these big payment companies in a room and all these big retailers and brands. And they would quickly turn around and go, well, we don't really need you, Josh. Like what, what's your point in this? Um, so great idea, but kind of not really what I was really passionate about. So fed up with this kind of idea, uh, amongst friends over a beer, uh, I said, you know, imagine if socks could change the world sort of as an off the cuff comment. Um, I always liked fun, colourful socks, never really thought much else of it. And um, I always say, you know, five, six beers later, that idea became a lot better idea. Um, but it's kind of this idea that we all wear socks and if every single pair could do a little bit of good. You know, is it that crazy to think that socks could change the world? Um, back to Google again. Uh, so Googling, how do you make socks? How do you change the world? Um, I always say Google's kind of my co-founder. It's so much information you can learn, find yourself on there. Um, but you know, very much, you know, an idea is one thing, but how do you actually go and execute it? Um, 
I kind of getting into looking at socks more discovered that we wear socks for 16 hours a day. Yeah, you know, socks typically dull, uh, poorly made, um, uh, poorly made unethically and in terms of quality. Yeah, it's something that most of us wear, say, 16 hours every single day. Um, also, from a business point of view, you kind of look at it. Um, although socks have been around since ancient Egyptian times, you know, I'm sure everyone here wears them or has worn them at some point in their life. Um, you know, it's growing uh, a market that's growing at 8.5% a year. Uh, so again, some of the kind of data side of it, it's growing at 6.5% compound uh, growth rate a year. It's actually one of the fastest growing apparel items. And the average person in Europe buys 16 pairs a year, kind of from a business sense, you're like, well, this is like big market, obviously highly competitive. On the flip side, I also was obviously aware that, you know, the stats around millennials and younger people, I wouldn't say caring more than older people do, but, you know, in terms of our buying behavior and lots of stats around, you know, actively checking packaging for where items are made and uh, paying more for purchases that do good rather than ones that don't. Um, kind of could see these both trends kind of coming together. Um, and I also always felt like if I was going to start a business, I was going to start a business that does good rather than one that doesn't. I always never can understand how that wouldn't be a conscious decision of anybody to say, I'm going to make something poorly and damage the environment and hurt people rather than do it good. But it was never, you know, a conscious decision. It was just, you know, why wouldn't I do it that way? Um, so when we started back in 2015, um, we started with the United Nations Global Goals. Back then there was... Um, uh, seven of them, no, eight of them, sorry, eight uh, UN Global Goals. Um, and we launched and within three months, the UN kindly had changed it to 17. Um, it's a bit of a mess up there. We kind of launched with a sock aligned to each of the goals where you could stand for causes like gender equality, uh, hunger, uh, environment, water, and so on. And through a Tom's sort of shoes, buy one, give one model, we took the logos of those goals and put it on the ankles of the socks. And you stand with your feet. Uh, what do you stand for? We use these socks as bright, colourful ones to stand out for causes that matter to you. Um, but as I say, yeah, that quite quickly moved to 17. Um, we actually got up to 12, tangible impact on 12 of them. So you could buy a pair of our, um, try to think of them, uh, our tree ones. You'd buy one pair of socks, you'd plant 20 trees, you'd buy a landmine one, you'd buy one pair of socks, clear two square metres of landmine in Vietnam. Uh, you could vaccinate three kids against measles in Bangladesh and all these different kind of causes through this kind of model we'd built. Uh, kind of good concept, but quite complicated in the way that it was all structured and what we were trying to do. Um, and here, some more of our impacts. Uh, so yeah, one year safe water uh, in Ethiopia, um, educate a child for two weeks in Afghanistan, uh, all through the power of socks and, you know, kind of really getting into that mission of what if socks could change the world. Uh, all these kind of transactions that we do every day, but having a positive impact from them. Um, kind of getting into that two years later, become slightly, uh, I'll say slightly expert in, in socks and how they're made. Um, and by this point, we'd had a few kind of design flops. Um, still today, I do all designs myself, not become a fashion designer or anything like that. Although I love to tell my friends I am, uh, more just because I couldn't afford to pay anybody to design them. So I sort of self-taught. YouTube, myself, you know, illustrator, graphic design to design them. Um, but some of the designs I've done were complete flops. You know, we had some awful designs. Um, and so we'd actually donated those to homeless shelters um, and tried to, you know, kind of get rid of them, as it were, clear the warehouse in certain ways. And uh, in doing that, we, we, we got this kind of response. We didn't realize from homeless shelters that socks are one of the most requested items by homeless shelters. Um, as a wear through item, they're very rarely donated. Um, you know, we might donate money, coffee, old coats to a homeless person, but you'd never donate your old, you know, holy socks. They're kind of an, a wear through item that you wear till they get holes in them, they get smelly, they get odd, and then you throw them away and, and, and hopefully buy more. Um, but obviously, if you're on the streets and you're homeless, you're walking more than the average person, and you don't have the luxury of fresh, clean socks every day, can lead to a number of very serious foot health issues uh, from something as basic to most of us as socks. Um, and the more we got into this, we kind of to learn more and more about it. So you hear about trench foot in the war, about damp feet and um, fungus and stuff you can grow. Um, I mean, the term is trench foot. There's definitely a medical term that I can never pronounce. Um, but that still exists today with homeless people that can lead to amputations and more serious conditions just from fresh, clean socks. Um, so, you know, you kind of imagine, you know, you're walking, uh, caught out in the rain. Um, I'm up here in Manchester at the moment. It rains quite a lot. Um, you get soaked through your feet, your socks, everything. Um, you know, most of us would go home, 
um, take our socks off, dry our feet, put a fresh pair on in the morning and, and carry on our, our walks. But obviously, con contrast that if you're homeless, you get wet, cold and soaked just the same as, as a normal person would uh, walking out in the open. But you don't go home to a warm house. You don't take your socks off. You spend the night in those cold, wet, damp socks and the next day you start walking. And this is where the kind of the serious kind of issues issues can kind of happen from, from basic something basic that we all say is, is socks to our, us all. So our kind of model shifted at this point. We kind of tested it out. We launched one sock. I, I hated it the most. It was a plain gray sock. I loved our fun, colorful ones. And for every pair of socks we sold, we said we would donate a thick antibacterial pair to homeless. For say 29 year old, I'm, I'm knowing far too much about how socks are made, but we'd realized by this point, we had some knowledge in how socks are made. We could utilize, um, we could utilize our supply chain and our expertise to make the greater sock for homeless people. Um, you know, it's antibacterial, it's reverse engineered packing sock uh, and donate that for every pair we sell. It actually costs three times the cost of our uh, retail socks at the time, but we've, we've kind of worked on that obviously with scale. Um, but anyway, that sock launched, it basically did five times better conversion, better sales than any other sock we'd ever launched. I thought at first, or maybe it's just because it's a plain design and all of our ones are bright and colorful. So we started to adapt on some other designs uh, and started seeing the same trend and realized that was what was working and our impact was so much more clearer. Um, and then we started to do some research and had some more things on this and realized there's a huge correlation between cause-led businesses and the product and the impact and obviously our you know buying socks and donating socks makes far more sense in a consumer psychology than buying socks and giving water or buying socks and clearing landmines you know in the early days we used to win a lot of awards and get a lot of press on that well, say crazy idea but to consumers we always say if we ask 10 customers what we did they would give us nine different answers of say you know, oh, they do these great colorful socks. Oh, they do these great socks for water. Oh no, they do these great socks for trees. And it's kind of very complicated to hard to scale and understand message. Um, and what we realized is simplicity really kind of made a big difference in, in what we want to do. And, and now we've built the scale where we can now revisit a lot of our other initial causes in a better way, because we've got a lot more data and insights. Um, so as mentioned, yeah, the socks we donate, very high quality, um, which is always one of the misconceptions. I think people assume that it's like, the NAF is cheaper sock we can make, and it's really not. And we really need to make that clearer to customers. Uh, as I say, it costs us quite a bit more. Um, but yes, yeah, especially made um, high, you know, hiking sock that's been made for the needs of a homeless person. Um, and these, these are what they look like. Um, but obviously to be able to donate um, plenty of socks um, through our model, it's a buy one, give one. We need to be able to sell a lot of socks in the first place to fund that impact. You know, we're not a charity, we're not asking for handouts and donations to buy the socks, to go to our impact, to go back around the circle, to ask for handouts again, and that never ending cycle, you know, we're sustainable kind of impact in that sense. So, you know, what we adapted and did to our um, uh, homeless socks, we also did to our, our retail socks. Um, so we call them socks 2.0, uh, socks you'd be proud to wear. So we did a number of advanced uh, improvements of our socks. So we've got a unique arch support shape that's a uh, more comfortable fit. Um, we have seen with closure. We've got a number of trademarks on some of these terms that we can't talk about, but a number of technology that's gone into why these socks are not just another pair of socks, our retail ones. Um, obviously, although it sounds obvious, we do to also say it, you know, we use ZX audited factories. So the workers in all of our factories are not just treated, obviously, to the basic levels they should to a very high standard uh, we're independently audited on that we have the yarns that we use the processes we use the packaging we use everything is to the highest sustainability you know criteria as possible obviously with any kind of production there is it's never zero obviously but you know using fsc card rather than you know, unsustainably sourced paper or card, or, you know, using sustainably sourced cotton rather than unsustainably sourced cotton, uh, using materials like bamboo, which can be, you know, less uh, impact on water and pesticides and other things compared to other materials. So we're always trying to think of what we can do and it's always trying to balance that out with what we can do, but also what can make a great product um, and try not get too many trade-offs when we're doing that. Um, and out of all this, um, which kind of came out and we're in Dragon's Den a little bit, but not too much, we actually launched a second brand. 
Um, so we've got our kind of really good Stanford socks that's been going for five years, growing and scaling in a very colorful, bold, great proposition of what it does. Um, but using our technology and our expertise, we actually launched a second brand uh, quite recently um, called Strides. Um, it's an athleisure brand, much like a Gymshark. And we do great, you know, performance socks for running, cycling, uh, gym, and we've kind of got a number of other products and developments that can't really talk about today that are coming with that brand. And there's a whole reason why why we've created two brands in what we do. Um, so obviously, yeah, Christmas uh, last year we're on Dragon's Den, um, uh, which was a, an interesting experience. I think you know, growing up, um, you know, many of us watch a show. I think definitely Dragon's Den and The Apprentice and these sort of shows did kind of inspire me, amongst uh, you know Richard Branson and many others. Um, Kind of growing up you know kind of always just kind of great to be on that uh, so when the opportunity came up um we we kind of gave it a good bit of thought and uh, yeah we went on it um in, interesting kind of experience how it all happens obviously you know the amount of time you're actually in the den compared to what's shown on tv is a little bit different uh sort of it's just over two hours and then obviously edited down to about 10 minutes but um two of the kind of quotes that i always quite liked was tuka this comment of like you know i spent five years building this business and i've like completely you know pardon the pun work my socks off but everything into building this company and then tuka comes out with this comment of like the only thing impressive here today is you which is kind of like a compliment but also a back-ended compliment because he's kind of insulting my business and what i've spent so long building um and when i first walked in obviously we're talking about how great our socks are and Peter Jones obviously is quite well known for, for his socks and his own sock brand. Um, and so, yeah, um, Tage obviously asked if our socks were more comfortable than Peter's, to which I, I said, um, if they're Peter's own brand, then, then yeah, <laughs> they are. Uh, just because of all the technology we had. So a little bit of kind of banter there, but kind of great experience and great kind of exposure um, for, for the brand uh, more recently. Um, obviously, probably skimmed over this, but kind of our model is a direct consumer. Um, I'm sure a lot of you would understand what that is, but you know, call it e-commerce, call it whatever. We produce the socks through to delivering them to the customer's door. We own that whole touch points. There's no, you know, selling to wholesalers. There's no middlemen. There's nothing there. You know, we have direct contact with our factories, just as we have direct contact with our customers. Um, there's a lot of benefits for that. Obviously, it's a lot more uh, work, but it means you've got so much more data and insight on everything. Um, also, you know, arguably the margins a little bit better, which you know it needs to be because we're making a higher quality ethically made product and for every pair we're selling compared to other brands, we're also donating one. So we're actually selling two or the cost of two. Um, but you know, that says so a lot of benefits for it. It's a lot more scalable than you know us opening one store here in Manchester and then maybe another in London. Um, our o overheads are arguably lower, but they're also higher because we pay shipping and storage and warehousing costs. Um, so pros and cons to it, but kind of a model for both brands that we really like. Um, we work with influencers and uh, collaborations, which, you know, not to patronise anyone in the room, but obviously younger people in the room probably do understand. Um, so, you know, this, you probably can see it, this dog here, um, it's called Puggy Smalls. He has an insane amount of followers uh, on Instagram. He works with uh, lots of big brands and we got him to do some photos of us. Uh, but basically, yeah, we kind of work with lots of different influencers to give them socks. Um, to post about it, we have actor Michael Sheen, uh, does a lot of promotion for us as well. Um, and I think, you know, not in a bad way, but we're quite fortunate that this stuff doesn't cost us as much as it probably does other brands because we're also doing good. So there's kind of a trade-off there as well. But you know, we do a lot of digital marketing, you know, advertising on Facebook, Instagram, Google, um, as well as, you know, kind of what we can do, traditional marketing as well. Um, what's also a lot of people don't realize, and certainly they didn't realize on Dragon's Den, is we have two parts to our business model. We have a B2B part, as well as the B2C, so B2C business to consumer, so we sell straight to customers, and B2B where we sell to businesses. Um, here are some of the brands that we work with. And this is part of our business model that kind of came out of nowhere. It wasn't planned when we started. Um, Burberry was one of the first companies to come to us. And my thinking at the time was why is a fashion brand trying to come and get socks made for, from another fashion brand? Um, but here are some of the brands we work with. We do custom socks for companies, for their staff, for their clients, for conferences, for marketing campaigns. Um, and it's kind of a very important part of our business. Uh, it gives us great reach. There's lots of great benefits to it. Um, you know, we do socks for Facebook all over the world and it's kind of like a fantastic kind of thing for such a business of our size. Like we are very, very small, really. Um, and yet we kind of can work with all these, these big companies. Um, so I've kind of adjusted my kind of slides, uh, for this slightly. So it goes a little bit off, off the rails here, but, uh, yeah, kind of 
kind of wanted to give you a bit of an idea of, of you know what we do and some of the lessons we've learned um you know obviously as starting a business you know you wear many hats um you know literally is i wear all these hats i kind of do everything from start to finish the good thing is in building the business the way i have we haven't taken investment we bootstrapped it um so you know i still own 100 percent the company um but we're able to i've been able to understand every part of the business because i've done it myself so when we brought people in or we've worked with partners and outsource things you know we know how it works and we know what's good value who good partners are who's how to train people in these sort of jobs um it also means that's a bit slower so obviously there's always a trade-off there as well um so i think very quickly to kind of want to skim over kind of five top lessons uh as a warning there's a lot of memes um but yeah the last five years uh, what i've kind of learned all the mistakes that we've made um so first one um uh, not you can't please everyone uh so stop trying um I think, you know, too early on, you know, definitely obviously listen to customers. We have so much data and insights and we do value that. But at the same time, you also got to go with your gut reaction. Um, you know, there's always that famous quote by Henry Ford of if I asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse because um, obviously before cars were invented. Um, but, you know, there's going to be every time we've launched something, customers on social media or all over have said, oh, you know, I really want bamboo socks. And then we go and launch bamboo socks and they're I oh, know I want merino wool socks or something else and you know there's always you can't do everything and stop trying to please everyone you know your business your pricing your proposition is not going to appeal to everyone so you know find who it does work for and double down on that don't try and please everybody you know starting a business is very hard um, a lot of respect for people who do it um, you know you're going to have great comments and positive comments about what you do uh, and they're going to make you feel good but also like you know one in ten bad comments is going to like really hit you um and you've got to try not let it take it personally even though when you built it from scratch you know all the way up you know it's, it's going to so you know try and you know i remember someone always said about being an emotionless cockroach uh don't fully be that but you know you've got to kind of take it with a pinch of salt what customers or people say about your business they haven't you know come on the journey you've got to get there um so kind of do do what you think's right uh, for the business um i think this is a very key one um that a lot of people it's always a big debate um you know making money and doing good isn't a bad thing um people will make you feel bad and make comments about that you know the thing that i always say is you know when people say oh you know yes you make money and you do good they think we're profiting off a cause and i think it's completely far from the truth i think you know what we say is that no one's criticizing nike or all the other sports brands out there or sock brands who are making money not doing good yet we get criticized for making money and doing good it's it's kind of a complete you know misalignment i think the way i see it um there's a really good kind of ted talk on it by uh, dan paletti um about kind of charity and the way we think about charity being very wrong and i very much recommend it um but you know today is a very different world you know consumers expectations you know the power of social media our thoughts on the environment people planet and impact are very different than they used to be um you know i've been running this business for five years you know 16 hour days crazy amount of time in it we've made losses for the first four years i've supplemented those losses but i'm very proud of the imp that because our model is impact led we've had a great impact um so you know you've got to kind of look at it that way we've had an impact every single year even though we've not made a single penny i haven't paid myself a penny um but you know making money and doing good is better than making money not doing good and i think that's you know seems obvious when we stop and think about it but you know starting any kind of social enterprise or business that's trying to do good you're going to face critics but ignore them um skip inside so yeah and very much you know we've we we thought this hypothesis at the start you know us doing good is an investment not a cost you know five years in we can say that's completely true and you know us making a better quality product with the proper environmental impact us donating a pair us supporting charity causes actually on all of our metrics across the business helps us have you know, higher customer loyalty has higher average order value has higher everything else and that's not a bad thing you know i think people think that is um so yeah doing good is investment not a cost um obviously another one is an mvp and we hear this all the time minimum viable product and you know testing quickly and all this kind of stuff you know i you know coach and mentor a lot more now 
and I tell other people this, but I never did this at the start. So I'm telling it again as uh, you know, really good advice, but we spent two years, you know, perfecting the product, making things great. You know, we, I was running a sock company for a year without any socks. Like I was doing the website, I was perfecting everything. We had all of our socks land and I was working in my mum's shed uh, at the time uh, for the first couple of years. And I had thousands and thousands of socks sat there. And then we launched on social media and then we launched a website because I was worried this whole everyone was going to steal our idea and we can't go out there in public yet. You know, by this point, you know, unfortunately, I'd fallen onto benefits. I was struggling and, you know, I was very much like putting everything into this business. And it was kind of a struggle in the sense that because everyone knew this is what I was doing. I wanted this to be kind of... Um, perfect when i launched it people were going to judge me straight away I'm completely wrong what i should have done is launch quicker just got it out there got some feedback changed things launched a bit more got some feedback you know we launched and i think the first two weeks we had about 10 clicks on our website which i'm pretty sure like my mom and my grandma maybe just coming on the website um it, you know it wasn't very much you know a big song and dance um you know no one say so no one cares as much as you think they do um so launch quickly, you know, we've now five years in, we're about to launch a number of product updates, a um, number of new you know, things we're launching, can't really say too much yet, but, you know, we've been testing those out in lots of different ways, you know, A-B testing, uh, MVP, launching a website, driving some ads towards it, getting some feedback, you know, if you, obviously you all kind of will probably know, but if you ask someone about your idea, we do a little business survey, like, would you pay for this? Everyone's always going to be supportive and say yes, you know, it's called the mum test, um, they're always going to support what you do if you can get someone to go to a website and put their card details in to buy something obviously that's a far better proof of concept than anything else you can do um i didn't do it i knew i should have done it at the start i still will really not great on it but i can't you know iterate that enough like we've learned so much i think there came a time two years in when i started doing pop-up markets uh, in the pouring rain and the cold uh, around Christmas. We had a lot of stock and we were kind of struggling to actually even get the business to even stay afloat and getting face to face with customers and then looking at our products and going like, I really want to buy like this design, but I like this cause. Like it just became so clear, like how wrong our proposition was or how complicated it was, but we didn't realize that because we were hiding behind computer screens doing an online model. So the quicker you can get out there, the quicker you can learn, the quicker you can test in the most real scenario, the better. You know, we would have, we'd be two years ahead or three years ahead from where we are today if we'd done that sooner. So definitely, definitely uh, recommend that. Um, and, you know, yeah, test and learn, you know, build great relationships. We've got, like, honestly, an insane supply chain now. Like, it's one of our most valuable thing. Um, such great relationships with all of our supply chain that allows us to do some of the really innovative things that we're doing now that we were never able to do in the first couple of years so testing and learning building that experience building that knowledge as i say for a 29 year old i know far too much about how socks are made and the textile industry um but you know by being in it and learning about it and embracing it you know when i started i knew nothing um just testing and learning testing and learning um I think this is something as well I only kind of realized quite recently. We were working with Adyen uh, over in Amsterdam um, and they kind of taught us this mentality of uh, build for now, design for tomorrow. Um, so this is kind of some pictures here on the left is, is me and my flat. Uh, and honestly, it's sad to say, but this was three years in. This was still the scene. I'd moved out of my mum's house and shared. I'd moved up to Manchester. Um, I had a bedroom, well, not even a bedroom, a whole flat just full of socks, you know, stood up to the ceiling. I had them all over all the walls. Uh, my housemate luckily didn't mind too much, but it was a bit awkward when you bring friends around or people around the flat and there's just socks everywhere and you haven't told them you sell socks and they're kind of that awkward kind of comment they've got eventually to bring up of going like, do you like socks? Like, what is this? Um, but that's what we had, you know, that's the reality of it. It was sleeping in a bedroom with honestly floor to ceiling, just boxes and boxes of thousands and thousands of socks. And then we had this ironing board here that I would hand pack all the socks. So an order would come in and honestly, you know, it wasn't that many orders. It was one a day if we were lucky, maybe five a week. And I would hand pack the orders and I would take them down the post office. I would take my ticket number, I would queue up and I would post them. And it's three years into the, running this business full time that I thought we were scaling and we were like, we're going to be this huge business one day and we were great. But really, we hadn't put the foundations in place to allow us to scale. You know, when I look back, the amount of hours I was spending doing all this stuff just fully wasn't scalable. Um, and then, 
you know, we also, I mean, one more thing very early on, we hand wrapped every pair in tissue paper. I don't know when that seemed a good idea, when that was ever going to scale to be able to do thousands and thousands of pair, pairs a month. Um, you know, today now the picture on the right, we're in a professional warehouse. We've got all computer systems and clever things and, you know, really kind of scalable and outsource that to a partner that we work with. And it allowed us to free up so much of our time to focus on, you know, the sales and marketing that leads to more sales, which leads to more, you know, step changes. But, you know, as I say, you've got to, everything you build and do, always think in the back of your head, and this is the design for tomorrow, how it can be 10 times bigger. So if you're packing socks on an ironing board and it takes two or three hours, if you spend 10 times more hours doing that, that's all you're doing and you're not doing anything else. So, you know, build for now, like do what you can for the size of the business that you are today, but design for tomorrow, like have at the back of your mind what you're going to need to do next and at what point or commercially you can afford to do that. And then, you know, as dyslexic, uh, this is probably really important, but get a grip on numbers. And it's so obvious and always says it, you know, know your numbers. But and that's on two levels. I think, you know, knowing your business model, knowing your profitability, knowing your um, all that stuff. I, I did business at school. I did business at university. And I still was never doing it that great. Even when we went on Dragon's Den, we were still fluffing the numbers about VAT and all sorts. So we only really got onto it most recently. But just get a grip on the numbers. It makes the business and decision making so much easier if you know, you know, your whole cash is king, but you know, you know your cash flow, you know your impact. Coronavirus has hit us like every other business. Uh, no one could see that coming. So knowing our numbers and being able to adapt and adjust really quickly and look at the opportunities and look where we're losing revenue and where we can cut costs and where we cannot cut costs. You know, we made decisions early on not to furlough anyone, but that's quite an expensive cost and let with revenue and sales down. So all these sort of things, you know, and on two levels, you know, it's knowing your numbers on the business way, but I think also knowing your numbers on the uh, strategic way. So like lots of metrics and KPIs that we use across the business, but stuff like cost per acquisition and uh, customer lifetime value, knowing these numbers just makes you run a far more scalable business. You know, we are scaling, our numbers on Dragon's Den are, are quite high. Uh, they didn't believe them at the time. I fully still believe we're going to hit those numbers this year. And I've got models and forecasts that show how we're going to hit that um, because we've got so much data and insights from knowing our numbers now. Um, but again, we couldn't scale, you know, in the first two years because we didn't know where we were making money, where we were losing money, what was efficient in the business, what wasn't. So, Honestly, know your numbers. I hate it. I'm dyslexic. I'm really bad at it, but I've learned it with software and tools you can use like Zero and Float. And uh, yeah, just just know your numbers as best you can. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's been a journey for us. It's five years in. You know, no investment, bootstrapped it. We're really scaling and growing now. We're at a really exciting stage. Um, but you know, as we say, it's still one step at a time. Stuff we were doing five years ago, very different to what we're doing now and stuff we'll be doing in another five years will be even more different on a whole other scale. And it's an exciting journey, um, but, you know, what if socks could change the world? And yeah, take it kind of one step at a time. And uh, sock on is our, our catchphrase. Sorry, I've spoken at 100 miles an hour there, but... Uh, no, that was so brilliant, Josh. Thank <laughs> you. So I'm just going to minimise this, but I'll share Josh's social links at the end. Um, so that was brilliant. I've got a couple of questions based on the polls and then we'll go back to the questions tab. So 74% of people have heard of a social enterprise, which is great. 95% um, of people wear socks. So that other 5%, um, go and get on Stanford Socks website, you need some. And this is an interesting one, you know, how m much more likely you are, are you to buy a product that does good? And 97% of people say, yes, they would be more likely to buy a product. And I think that reflects a lot of what we've seen in kind of business today is that people want businesses that stand for something. And why did that kind of matter to you when you were starting Stand for Socks? To have a purpose? Yeah, good question. I think I always say, and it honestly was never a conscious thing, you know, not to slam Nike at all, but, you know, people think of Nike in the sweatshops. I'm kind of like, at what point? Obviously, they, they're a lot better now, but when back then, when that was ever a decision, I don't think there was a conscious decision. It was just an oversight or something they didn't prioritize. But, you know, when we were manufa you know, manufacturing and looking into it, you know, we went to factories all over the world. We went to China, we went to Turkey, we went to all sorts. And it was like, why wouldn't we, why would we mm. cut corners and, and do stuff cheaper? Um, I always love, yeah, what do you, you know, people want to stand for more and it uses our brand name um, and, and stand for a better, better world. But, 
you know, it just wasn't for me. It was never a conscious decision. I think for a lot of young people, it wouldn't even be a conscious decision. It would just be a, well, why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we do it that way? And do you think we, you know, lots of the young entrepreneurs that we work with have, um, have brands that focus on um, fashion, textiles. Do you think it's more important that people know where they're coming from? Or do you think there's a trade off between price and kind of the sustainability in production? I think it's de yeah, definitely important to know where it's come from and know you've got to really, and it's not hard, you know, not hard, it's not easy sorry, when you start because you don't know anything about this industry. So even with me, I thought, you know, rocking up at a factory or well, they make the yarn and they produce the socks. You don't realize that there's all these other factories and stages mm. and companies that you don't even know are before the stage that you're seeing. So it takes a while to kind of really understand that supply chain. But, you know, we build this fantastic relationship with one of the biggest sock suppliers in the world. Um, we were without doubt their smallest customer, um, but they love, you know, what we're trying to do. They love our mission. And so we get so much time from them and we built such good trust and respect that they now, you know, have helped us understand that mm. whole supply chain and help with their leverage and power us to almost change and impact part of that supply chain in that country, um, which is just fantastic. And I think, you know, knowing it as much as you can, but yeah, it's, it, it's also educating the customers because that's one of the biggest things we don't, we try and do, but it's very hard to do when you pop up on Facebook or Instagram with an ad and someone just price and the picture of a sock and goes, well, to me, you know, £10 for a pair of socks, a sock is £1 in Primark. And I'm like, well, yeah, but a Primark sock and our socks aren't the same. Mm. But we'll have a conception of socks just like they do of coffee. You know, a cup of coffee at Starbucks is £3.50. A cup of coffee, you know, somewhere else might be 50p. Uh, not to get too much into Starbucks, but there's kind of difference in value and um, and, and product. Uh, yeah. It's trying to get customers on that. And Obviously, your business has got a clear purpose, and you say that one of the problems that you had early on is that it's hard to kind of articulate where that, you know, where the good that you're doing goes to and really highlight your business model. Lots of the young entrepreneurs that we work with are about to come up to their pitches for National Entrepreneur of the Year, and they're kind of working out how they can tell their stories more succinctly. And I think what would be, I think, interesting is how important is it to distill why your brand is more important or why your business does what it does and what it stands for like how important is that when you're either looking to sell it get funding i know that you're um you totally own your company but what where does that kind of come in yeah and for me and i've only learned this more recently it's always it's not how because i think for so much at the start i always focus on how i want to tell it and what we do differently and what we 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 rather than always thinking of who you're talking to so i think with any of that you know stuff whether you're pitching whether you're investment whether you're selling to customers you're selling to partners always think of the audience and actually not what i want to tell them what they actually want to hear um I'm not saying tell them what they want to hear is not true but what you focus on you know if you go and say here's the 20 reasons why we're an amazing business and why you should invest in us or why we should win this award or why you should partner with us they don't probably care about 18 of those points mm -hmm. but think about the points that they care the most about and i think really focus on storytelling um i think again that's something that we didn't do we we you know took tom shoes we took happy socks we took a lot of big companies that are already out there we mashed them together all these different ideas and then added three or four usbs on top and then we're like this is what we do and this is, this is why we're so much better than all these other companies without realizing what do customers actually want what do people actually care about and how do we communicate that in a really simple way um over complicated things and people switch off you know people are only human and they their attention span to certain things only matters so if you communicate it in a way they care and focus on two or three things um we said when we launched strides we'd rather be you know the best in the world at two or three things rather than be good at 20 things yeah um so it's kind of really kind of drilling it down to the, what's actually people care about i think that's a really good answer so i'm going to go into the the question section so this is from scott laidlaw did you have any good teachers who encouraged you in school? And do you think if you'd gone to a different school, well, maybe they'd encourage that kind of enterprise entrepreneurship and not dampen that spirit by trying to expel you, that you've maybe had a slightly different path in life? Or do you think it was it was being told that you were sort of doing it wrong that kind of made you move forward and do it right? Yeah, very good question. I think, yeah, I don't know. I mean, hindsight, you know, 
obviously Peace Jones Foundation, if that was around then and I joined that, obviously 100 percent that would be a very different <laughs> experience. Um, you know, stuff like New Entrepreneurs Foundation, a lot of these obviously massively helped. If I didn't have those and you know, things like Peace Jones Foundation now and all these, they didn't exist then, you know, then I probably wouldn't be doing what I was doing because I would have I was kind of the outlier, I was the rebel as it were. So if I wasn't encouraged to be an entrepreneur, then with other people around me, I wouldn't have done that. You know, no offense. My family's been very supportive of me, uh, although critically probably supportive of, you know, when are you going to get a real job? And, you know, I think it's probably an issue with perception on entrepreneurship today that if someone, you know, wants to, uh, wants to start a coffee company, let's say a coffee shop or a hairdresser, they don't have to become the next Starbucks. And I think very much when we, you say you want to be an entrepreneur and start a business, you're put into that Peter Jones, Richard Branson, Elon Musk mm -hmm. stage that you have to make millions, if not, you're a complete failure. And obviously, like lifestyle entrepreneurship, I think it's massive. You know, I remember doing a talk at a school uh, career day uh, to a bunch of kids, and I said I was an entrepreneur, and they kind of really didn't understand what I meant and found out one of the kids' his dad was a builder, had his own company. And I said, your dad's an entrepreneur. And I got into this debate with this kid. And he was basically saying, no, no, my dad's a builder. I said, no, no, he's an entrepreneur. He's got his own business. He said, so I think this perception is very different. I think you know, at school, it just wasn't a priority. Um, mm -hmm. At university, also, to be honest, wasn't. They, university, they very much t uh, educate you, especially a business degree, mm -hmm. to go and work for big companies, um, to go work for the big, you know, global corporates. They aren't getting you ready to go start a company because at the end of the day, if you were probably going to do that, you wouldn't have gone to university. Yeah. I think very good answer. And I think it, it's that thing as well, whether it's a side hustle um, or a main hustle, if you're running your own business, you're an entrepreneur, you've already showed that you can get up, get out there and start to sell. And I think that's a huge step. And that's the, that's the, sort of the hardest one to take. 100%. And now um, a question from uh, Bill Muirhead. In terms of supply chain, what challenges have you experienced as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? And how have you overcome them? You know, what's your approach to facing adversity generally? And I think I'll kind of, bring that in with a question um, which, let me just find it, which Scott Laidlaw also said, you know, it sounds like you've had some tough moments. So there have been some tough times. There are tough times in everyone's entrepreneurial journey. We champion resilience as one of the most important skills in entrepreneurship. What have you been doing to overcome them? Yeah, um, good questions. I think, I mean, firstly with supply chain, like I think on, and the whole, you know, pandemic, and it's impacting everybody so it's not like uh we're we're suffering more than others mm -hmm. i think we're arguably not suffering as much as others are so i'm kind of taking you know glass half uh, uh half empty half full that kind of approach i'm going well we've got you know we're impacted and we're bad but we're nowhere near as bad as other people so we'll we kind of accept that i think you know at the end of the day it kind of comes back to priorities our factory shut whole supply chain shut i can't argue with that i think that's the right thing for them to do um you know protecting lives and everything else is far more important than socks and everything else so you know we fortunate in one sense we had a lot of way too much stock coming into this so we were kind of all right we've kind of you know to keep shipping orders online yeah. um obviously overnight you know loads of b2b and custom stock orders just disappeared and that's a lot of our kind of profitable revenue so that's been tough um we, we took approach to say that we weren't going to furlough anyone. We took on lots of freelancers. We kind of saw the opportunities and the positivity in what we can do. You know, oh, we can't, you know, ship socks uh, to custom, you know, socks for companies, but companies want to send socks to staff that work from home. Well, there's a whole different business model that didn't exist to us a month ago. Let's now flip to that. And we're able to kind of work with some great companies and, and do that. Um, so kind of been fortunate in that sort of sense. And I think, you know, it's, it's being a... a you know, a girlfriend and stuff hates it, but I'm a very positive person. I think I frame everything in a really new positive way. I remember a point about three years in, say on benefits, still on benefits three years in, it wasn't, it wasn't a great start. And um, housing benefit, you know, job seekers benefit, trying to start this company, trying to kind of get off the ground, got all this pressure about, you know, your family saying, you know, you should get a real job and, you know, you've given it a good crack, but, you know, get on with it now. And friends are getting good promotions and their lives are moving on. And I'm kind of like, what am I doing? You know, and, you know, I think there was a time when I like, I don't cry much, but I kind of completely broke down in tears because mm -hmm. and it was at the point at our end of year that we realized the impact that we'd had. I think we'd made about a seven or eight grand loss. So I'd, 
not made any money that year from the company and I was also funding that loss. Uh, but I kind of saw the impact we had of, you know, how many kids were vaccinated against measles, how many trees we planted, you know, all of these impacts we had across the world. And again, it was like, my life's not great. I mean, you know, on benefits and I'm not got enough money to like have a lifestyle that I want to have, but I still can eat. I've still got a house and here's all the positive impact I had. And I kind of was like broke down in tears, very upset. So I think, you know, through the tough times we have, you know, we still see the impact. We launched um, an NHS Health Hero sock um, during the pandemic. We couldn't make any new socks. We did a pre-order mock-up, computer mock-up of a new design. And we said for every sock we sell, we are going to donate a pair to homeless as normal. And we're going to donate a current stock to a frontline worker in the NHS. When we learn about some shortages and PPE around the ankles and what stocks can do. And our customers like completely just bought into it. Like in 24 hours, we'd sold over 600 pairs, which is really kind of crazy. We're like, we you buy a sock now, we're going to send it to you in three months' time. Like, that's a good idea. And so, you know, we kind of looked at the positives and what we can do rather than what we can't do. Um, and I kind of, that's my attitude of everything. I think it's the best way to be. Yeah. And I really like this question from Sean, which is lots of, lots of young entrepreneurs, older entrepreneurs, all entrepreneurs have an idea. You can have a great idea. You think it's going to work, but it's, a, you know, how do you get go from that idea to prototype and manufacturing? You know, is that the hardest step for you? Yeah, I think I, idea to execution is completely different things. You know, the amount of friends, uh, quite a lot of entrepreneurial circles, I'm, I, you know, I'm in over the last few years, and the amount of friends I know that claim to have invented, you know, Dropbox and Facebook and all this, I'm like, well, yeah, but you didn't execute it as well as these yeah. other, you know having an ideas is easy we can all have ideas it's actually executing it and you know not enough you know emphasis is put on the execution part you know arguably over the last five years i haven't executed this business that well however i've just kept going and we've kept working things out and learning and changing and adapting and you know now arguably we are getting traction and we are becoming hopefully a successful company but you know we're looking at some guys in the us that we want to be like and they are, you know, not even a hundred times bigger than us. They're thousands of times bigger than us. So we've got a long, long way to go um, in executing, you know, a lot better. Um, so it's kind of on that. And I think, you know, where do you start? I mean, you know, I was 20, uh, 23, 24 and starting a sock company with no experience in socks. And I went out to all these big trade shows. I went and met all these big factories. And just to be taken seriously was my hardest thing. Like, I literally, you'd rock up with, I had some cartoony pictures of like, basically back then it was like graffiti style socks i was like all socks are spots and stripes and like why can't we do graffiti on socks and i always say the best thing about not being in an industry you don't know the rules it's easier to break i didn't know what my ideas and stuff i was coming up with was completely ludicrous in the industry but i just didn't know any better so i was completely passionate and pushing that forward and i think you know meeting all these big factories and i just remember them being like, so who do you work for? Like, you're from the UK, obviously. They're like, you know, do you work for Topshop? Do you work for this? I'm like, no, no, I stand for socks. And they're like, who are stand for socks? I'm like, yeah, well, no one, because you don't have any socks at the moment. We're just this, barely even a website because I haven't launched it. So I think just being taken seriously, but, you know, pushing on. It took us, you know, the factory we work with now, it took us 18 months to convince them to work with us. I think it was about the fifth time that I went out to the factory in Turkey um that they eventually were like this, this kid's not giving up um so let, let's work with him um but you know it's if you could people would say it's a lucky break but you know you've got to be in the right place at the right time to get a lucky break so mm. we, if they hadn't taken the punt and worked with us we wouldn't be where we are today um we were about to order you know it's five thousand pairs minimum per color is the kind of standard in the industry so we were going to launch a website with three socks you know a red sock a blue sock and a green sock and have 15,000 pairs of them in a warehouse. And this factory basically turned around and said, look, if you do that, that's fine. We'll make some money on this one deal, but you're never going to sell them um, that many. You know, let's do a smaller quantity, 250 pairs per color, go test it, go learn, and then come back and buy more. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's worked out well for them because we're actually, we're still the smallest customer, without a doubt, but we're actually growing. We're actually real, real business now, whereas at the start, they kind of just helped us out. It's that hustler mentality, which um, I think young entrepreneurs in particular have in kind of bucket loads that you are, you don't, you know, naivety is on your side, your youth is on your side. You can go out and be hungry and learn. And people are probably more willing to help you if you're starting out and know nothing than if you're a bit further on and seem like a bit of a threat. Well, like, honestly, 100%. And no, again, no offence to anybody older, but I think we're so fortunate being younger that you can be more cheeky, you can push the boundary more, people want to help you because you're younger. And at the end of the day, a lot of the decision makers and people who hold 
the doors you know that you want to kind of push open are probably a lot older than you and they want to help someone younger so it's a far bigger advantage we have than me being 50 and trying to start a salt company mm. so what this is from claudia where do you see entrepreneurship going in the future and how do you see it evolving Ooh, very much. Uh, i don't know to be honest i, I think it's so much and i i always say this a lot like obviously i don't know my parents generation I wasn't around then but i feel like the older generation when they were younger and probably peter jones and richard branson these sort of guys were starting out the cool thing back then to do was to say you're in a band and start a band I think very much nowadays our generation with the likes of Facebook and Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and everything else, it's the cool thing to do is to say you start a company, but there's a very fine line between uh, being unemployed and starting a company. And for three years, I was very much <laughs> riding that fine line yeah. of saying I was an entrepreneur and I was starting this company and actually I'm just unemployed and, and I'm better. <laughs> so, um, but I, at the time, you know, I was completely engrossed in what I was doing. I loved it. I didn't see... I look back now, you know, sitting in a shed, starting this company, like I must have seen absolutely crazy. And I think if I had friends or people that were doing that now, I'd like have a quiet word with them going, come on, like seriously, what are you doing? But, you know, back then I didn't see it that way. So I think attitudes have massively changed um, and they are changing. I think, you know, obviously COVID you know, now and remote working, there's huge changes coming to all of that and people embracing technology a lot better. Like, you know, it's been... It's definitely now, but it's been the way for the last few years. It's never been easier to start a company. You know, you could launch a Shopify store or a WordPress website this afternoon and have it live by tomorrow. You can go on Alibaba and buy some products. You can, you know, all those technology and the internet has opened up the world for you to do anything. You know, YouTube, I say Google's our co-founder, probably YouTube even more so. Like, you can go on there and learn to code. You can go on there and learn graphic design. You can learn anything, like... We don't need to go turn up to a lesson or do a course in a lecture to learn something now at a certain time in a fixed location. Like you can kind of do anything and, and people's willingness to kind of help. So I think going forward, I think micro entrepreneurship will be a far bigger thing. There'll be far more people getting later in their careers in corporate jobs, leaving to start a company they can run from at home and probably earn as much money, if not more than they were in their corporate job, have far more control and flexibility over their life. Um, and then that through to, you know, huge companies. So I think, it's getting a lot better than it's ever been and it's going to keep getting that way. And and with kind of entrepreneurship, do you think, you know, it was obviously tough when you started out, do you think that people should sort of run it as a side hustle and see if they can convert it into a main hustle for as long as possible just to give that kind of security or do you think it's going at the deep end and make sure that you swim and not sink? 100 like 100%, it's such a hard one because I did it one way and it's worked out all right now, but it also... <laughs> wasn't easy um if i started business now at 29 i would do it a different way definitely like i wouldn't you know we didn't raise investment we got offered investment after we won some awards quite early on and i'm glad now obviously hindsight we didn't take it um we're looking at investment in the next 18 months but it's on our terms and it's when you know it's we've built this great foundations this great business and it's investment to scale so you know i've got friends that are now starting companies and they're thinking about taking investment and i'm actually probably saying you probably should take investment actually because you're this much older you've got a mortgage yeah. you know you want to move quicker i spent let's say three to four years learning yes i was running the company but actually all i was really doing was learning and perfecting everything so i've built a far better resilient foundation so as i say when i employ people now i've done the jobs that i'm employing them to do so i can train them really well and it makes us a lot more lean and agile yes but it's taken us five years to get there. So I think it's such a hard one because it's, I don't know if I would do it much differently than I did it, but I don't know. It's, it's a hard question, but you just yeah. got to see. Yeah. It depends on the business, depends on the, your personal scenario, what your ambitions are. Like, you know, don't start, I always say don't start a company to get rich because I spent five years, I've worked so hard and I'm definitely not rich and I would be far richer if I'd stayed in a regular job with Virgin and a corporate job. Um, you know, started because you want to disrupt something and you can't see yourself working for somebody else or you can't just, you know, go go learn. You know, side hustle stuff, 100%. Like, I, what I meant to say, actually, I took on a consulting job about three years in where I actually became... It was basically one of, I became Harry Ramson, the fish and chip chain in the UK. I basically ran all their digital um, for about two years um, as a side hustle, but it was the other way around. So I earned 100% of my income 
from the thing that I spent 1% of my time doing. The only reason I was able to get that job or that consultancy freelancer project was because I'd learned everything that I'd done yeah. for. So I didn't see at the time that I was, and then, you know, the uh, marketing director left Harry Rams and went to Giraffe and went to Chopsticks, a few other brands. And he started offering me their contracts. And I was kind of going like, I'm not trying to build a marketing agency. I don't, yes, I might, you know, I'm not saying I'm good at it, but yes, I can do that. I've learned it and it's cost efficient, but it's not my own, my passion is. Um, but I kind of, so I started off from benefits, built the company up and about three years in, I took some external work, which didn't take up much of my time to get some income in to fund, you know, the business to keep going rather than take investment. So it depends on the business, depends on the timing and personal circumstances. And that actually links really nicely to kind of next questions. We've got time for about two more. Um, and it's, how did you work out what type of advertising you're going to do? You know, you're a direct to consumer brand based online. How did you find influencers? Did you do much paid for advertising or was it mostly partnerships? Um, how did you get that up and running with quite um, a small budget? Yeah, and that's the thing. Our budget was non-existent. Like when I started the company, I had about three meetings um, that most of you went into stock. So yeah, literally we had marketing budget of zero. So we did all the stuff that we could do. We did traditional, you know, PR, we did blogs. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff was okay free and I could, it was time-based. It was my time to do it and outreach and, and grow it. It didn't really lead to many sales. Um, what we kind of eventually did, it's weird. I think the first two or three years, we didn't really market and we didn't really grow. And they, those are connected. Like we didn't realize that at the time. Um, when we started marketing, we started growing. And then also when you're starting to do something more, you start to learn what's working, what's not working. And we actually had a, I think by our, it was about, yeah, a lot happened in year three, about three, three and a half years in, we had about 16,000 pounds, like kind of money that we kind of made and compounded it and grown it and grown it and being very lean and we kind of decided to put that all into digital marketing into facebook google and that but we knew that we needed to spend enough money in it we couldn't just spend a hundred pounds and go well that didn't work move on what's the next idea so we put a lot of money in it we actually worked with an external agency and we kind of i think got that money back but learned a lot and then obviously we then did it again and compounded it you know now we spend insane amounts you know to be honest on facebook instagram google advertising but again two years of data and doing that really well we've got so much insights like a lot of our designs and our you know strides brand to be honest came from data insights we got from marketing from mm -hmm. marketing on the scale that we have been and um, also being, so being direct to consumer brand you immediately have that that first-hand data and you're not relying on an external retailer to kind of pass it on to you you know your customer really well 100 percent and, you know, at the end of the day, we've got their phone number and email address that they've given it to us. That we and you know they accept marketing, obviously GDPR, but we can talk to them. And at the end of the day, our customers are actually a lot more receptive. You know, not all of them, obviously, but a lot of them will give you so much good feedback and and talk to you. And you know, the world of data that we now live in with direct to consumer, it's it's great. And you know, working with influencers like Michael Sheen's been great, um, but a lot of them, it's quite a manual process of, you know, literally meshing them on Instagram, like. Well, everything that we've done, you know, from even my club nights to now, like we started with what's the most obvious thing? Well, if you want to contact these influencers, just start messaging them on Instagram. Try something for a bit and you'll realize by the time you've done it 100, 200 times, okay, either completely doesn't work or okay, it does work, but with this type of person or with this type of message or, you know, oh, it's working really well, we'll double down on it. And I think every marketing strategy we've done has been that way. I didn't, you know, I did a you know, I've done quite a bit of marketing more now, like programs and stuff, but I didn't come on marketing background. So again, we didn't know the traditional rules of marketing and marketing 101. So we did marketing our own way in the modern way. And, you know, we're fortunate because a lot of the bigger brands aren't doing it that way. Yeah. Uh, we're getting really big looking at TikTok and some of the newer things now where probably some of the bigger brands will be looking at that in a year or two. Um, so it's just being kind of guerrilla marketing, doing what you can. And there's a bit of paid and there's a bit of free, free is a bit of everything. And we're coming close to the end now, but I've got some big sock fans in the question section who are asking, you know, where can they find your socks? I'm going to share the link, but where can they find your socks? And do you make socks for kids? We do. I've just seen another question about socks. I'm going to answer as well. Um, yes. So yeah, we yeah, so find our socks. So www.standforsocks.com. It's uh, number four. Um, hopefully we've made it. We made a discount code today. 
PJF 20, 20 socks on the Amazing, website. Thank you. Um, yeah, any that aren't in the sleep because they're already discounted. Uh, but today, so www.sampersocks.com and obviously follow us on social media. Uh, Strides is www.strides.com as well. Um, we do do kids socks. We do Father's Day is coming up. We have, um, we're one of the few brands, uh, certainly in the UK, that does matching uh, dad and uh, dad and child sock uh, we have a lot of mums that say to us it's very rare if they have a son that they can have matching items because you know the dads is matching t-shirts and this stuff so we have a lot of mums that love those socks that can have matching um, socks with their son um, but yeah we do do two design for kids uh, but yeah, I see a question here about uh, how do we set ourselves apart from other sock brands such as Stance and Happy Socks uh, which I think is a good question because uh, Happy Socks is you know big inspiration when we started I think they've done very well one of the first fun, colourful sock brands, so we definitely look up to them. Um, the scale that they're now at and their retail route that they went down is very different to ours. So I think we're coming a lot more, they're definitely getting a lot more better at digital, but we've come from digital. Um, so we're competing in different ways to them. And Stance is one of those those big US ones I, uh, we look up to. Um, both those brands, I mean, Happy Socks and Stance have raised a lot of money. Um, pretty sure Stance raised something like well over 100 million before they started, they have Justin Bieber and all these sort of people as investors. So we are building a very different company. And we always use the hashtag, hashtag doing it our own way. Uh, so we do look up to these companies and they're doing stuff really well and they're really successful. Um, we're looking at what they do and we almost are doing the opposite and how we're building the company. Um, but we do take a lot from them. You know, we look up to them. They've, they've done it very well. So we sell, we're basically different businesses to them would be my answer. And I think if you're going into quite a saturated market, a busy marketplace, you can't do exactly the same as a more established competitor. You have to set yourself apart in a different way and being small and agile and doing things differently is going to be your, I mean, to your benefit. 100%, like we, and you know, it's been, it's been nice and frustrating at the same time. We're now at the stage where we've got people copying us uh, and it's flattering. We've got, you know, our logo is being copied, our uh, designs are being copied uh, and it's all that fun lawyer stuff. But you know, we very much focus on above us. You know, we've got, say, big brands we look up to. Where Our sites are set on them and how do we compete with them? And if they change to something similar to ours, how do we, you know, we, we look at a lot of strategy stuff and how we, what we can do and what markets we can move into where they aren't to compete with these big guys. We don't really look behind us at smaller guys who are up and coming now. Uh, and I think that's really important because in the early days, I used to look at so many brands and, mm. you know, you, can re you think you're doing socks and the market's this size and, well, everyone's going to buy our socks because we're all these reasons we're better than all these other brands. But at the end of the day, consumers don't think like that. So you just got to kind of look forward and look at the data and be different. But it's, it's a fun game, to be honest. Like, I, I love it. <laughs> and we've had, because I'm kind of teachers put in, do you do talks in schools? People have loved you today. We have loved you. Thank you so much. But do you go into schools? I mean, obviously at the moment, not possible, but do you go and do talks, kind of career days? You mentioned it a bit yeah. earlier. Yeah, we, yeah, we do. We do where we can. We're, we're based in Manchester, um, but I'm originally from Suffolk and we're in London a lot. Um, so yeah, we're launching a podcast soon, MC, the podcast. <laughs> um, so we, we're doing a lot more of that stuff, but yeah, we do do a lot of talks uh, at companies um, and, and schools and universities. Um, so the best way to reach out is contact at stampsocks.com um, and the team will pick it up there. Um, yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we, we do stuff and we're doing some stuff. Uh, well, we're looking at trialing some stuff with some schools at the moment for a national design competition for a new sock. Um, Amazing. So I was kind of interested in that. Um, definitely get in touch because it's a, a new idea and something we're trying to do, obviously, in the reactive, in the new, the new normal at the moment. But yeah. Josh, this has been incredible. Thank you so much. I think hearing about a journey, an entrepreneurial journey, which has been misplaced, going from the slightly dodgy dealings of um, fake IDs and riotous club nights to a social enterprise is really inspiring and it's been brilliant. I think we've valued everyone's participation throughout. Thank you for your brilliant questions. I'm just going to share all of Josh's um, social links in the chat box. So follow him, follow Sam for Socks, order. Thank you very much for the discount code. And then have a look at the sock competition, the upcoming podcast. What's its name and when should we be expecting it? The podcast. Uh, well, name to be confirmed, but it's all around business for good. Um, and and basically, yeah, what we're what we do, what we believe in, a lot of great 
fantastic social enterprises and social entrepreneurs we look up to, like Change Please, Bellu, um, trying to get lots of guests from that. It's kind of early stages, but yeah, all about this kind of business for good. It's definitely not charity, but it's also definitely not business as normal. Um, and hopefully launching, hopefully, uh, next few months. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. So the things are all in there. Thank you, everyone. We'll be sharing the recording later today. I know that some of you have asked. Josh, thank you very much. I'm going to go and buy some socks now. I think that everyone else will too. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Okay, thanks a lot.